All right, so then let's get started. I'm sure a few more people will trickle in, but uh, uh, we have quite a full program. So um, welcome and good morning, everyone. Um, if you haven't joined us yesterday, then uh, welcome uh, for the second day of this uh, uh, joint uh, Mobimix Solutions Plus workshop. Um, we're hosted at least virtually by our partner city, uh, Hamburg, um, and uh, this is organized by uh, the City Network Polis. Um, we will uh, look today into integrated shared e-mobility solutions. Um, and uh, how to integrate them into the public transport uh, system. We'll start uh, with a presentation from our colleague uh, Dominik Radutzweit, who is uh, running uh, the local demonstration in Hamburg in uh, the context of the Solutions Plus project. Um, Dominik is uh, from the Hamburger Hochbahn and he will share some lessons learned and some post pilot conclusions. And we will then go into the eHubs uh, project where we focus on uh, scalability and upscaling. And Bram serves from Autodalen will share a presentation on that. And then we'll have an opportunity to talk and discuss. Uh, do feel free to um, already get your uh, fingers sharpened on some questions. You can either um, put them into the chat box so that you and we don't forget them, but you're also free to and then just unmute yourself and, and raise the question directly. You, you know how to navigate in, in Zoom, I suppose. So you can raise your hand and then you pose the question directly to, to the panel. So let's start with a presentation from Hamburg and from Hochbahn. Um, uh, just a quick reminder indeed that we are recording this session. It will be made available. And uh, as usual, in these cases, do keep uh, yourselves muted when, when not speaking. Um, uh, we'll have also a quick poll uh, this morning to, to get us started. Window should pop up in a second. It's not working again, so... Okay, okay, no worries. Um, so continue. Sorry about that. Then, then feel yourselves polled, uh, 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 and we will move right uh, to Dominic. Uh, Dominic, over to you. Thanks, Oliver. Just give me the normal Zoom second for sharing my screen. Yeah, coming up looks good. So, and... Now it should be full screen, yeah? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Hello. Yeah, hello and good morning, everybody. Um, it's great to spend this second day of our Solutions Plus and Mobi Mix uh, workshop with you. For the ones who haven't been here yesterday with us, my name is Dominic, and as Oliver already mentioned, I work as Innovation Manager for Hochbahn. And as we are starting in uh, the workshop the section of integrating the shared e-mobility into the transport system, I'm very happy to present you Hochbahn's approach and our e-scooter project in cooperation with TIER. And for the introduction, I made it myself easy and picked out one of Gesine's slides from yesterday, and uh, where she described the potential and challenges in dealing with e-scooters from the perspective of the city of Hamburg. And we at Hofbahn with our pilot project try to find an answer for some of these situations on the pictures in order to combine the public transport system and e-scooters. So um, what can you expect in the next couple of minutes? Mainly three parts. First, I would like to make you familiar with our concept in general. Second, I would like to present the way we implement our e-scooter approach. And in the third part, the focus is on data and, as Oliver already mentioned, some of the first learnings we gained from the project so far. So, um, let's start with the concept. The approach of our demo action is providing and integrating e-scooters in outskirt areas as first or last mile solution to expand the public transport. And here you see a most likely first and last mile use case. The customer rides the e-scooter on his first mile from home to the closest metro station and ends his e-scooter right there. Then he simply changes to the metro and on the way back it is the same. The customer takes an e-scooter at the metro station, maybe the scooter is already reserved, maybe not, and rides it the last mile home. 
core of our concept are two areas that differ in terms of geographical and social demographical conditions. We operate with about 150 e-scooters in each of the two areas. Thereby, it is decisive that in both areas, there's a connection to the public transport. We need at least one metro connection. Over the project lifetime, we test different incentive schemes for the customers. For example, the customer receives three minutes every time he's parking his e-scooter in the parking zone at the stations. Two more aspects about the project's goals. On the one hand, we want to increase the attractiveness of public transport here in Hamburg. And on the other hand, we want uh, to establish the e-scooter as feeder to public transport and thereby create an alternative to the private car for the first and last mile. What has happened in our project so far? I will go through the most important steps of the last two years. In the second half of 2022, we launched a call for tenders and ultimately choose TIER as our cooperation partner. Together with TIER, we then identified potential areas and evaluated them based on criteria. I will briefly show you what these are on the next slide. After that, we prepared the final locations and parking zones. And here I can already mention one of the most important lessons learned from us. These physical parking zones at the four metro stations are one of the key factors um, for the integration of e-scooters into public transport. Back to the timeline. The launch of our e-scooter service took place in June 2021 with Hamburg Senator for Traffic and Mobility Transition. At the beginning of October 2021, shortly before the ITS World Congress in Hamburg took place, the e-scooters deep integration into Hamburg's mobility as a service app HVV switch was completed. From our project's perspective, this is the second crucial element for syncing public transport and e-scooters together. And of course, we are collecting data since day one. The next important step is to find out more about the customers and their behavior. For that case, we will start with a customer survey in the next days. What criteria did we use when selecting the two demo areas for our project? I will go over them quickly. We need a connection to public transport, for example, the metro and bus system, as I mentioned before. The availability of complementary mobility services, the population density, the target group, and the criteria on the tier brought into the selection process. We looked at app openings in the tier app that did not result in a ride. These app openings suggest a certain desire that could not be satisfied because the scooter is or wasn't available. Let's move to the implementation part of our project. We leave theory behind and look on how we connect the e-scooters with our public transport system. I would like to give you impressions from the project's practice. On the left, you see one of the two areas, Langhorn's business area. Two of the three stops here represented by the blue dots have been equipped with parking zones. In the middle of the slide, you see the technical sketches of these parking zones. And on the right, you see them two days before the project launch. Here, and this is the special thing about it, we have converted five car parking spots in order to set up the e-scooter parking zones in direct transition to our metro. The same applies to the second area. The special thing here in Lockstedt is that we are moving with our parking zones in public space. We already heard about that difficulty in some of the presentations yesterday. On the slide before in Langhorn, we simply rent car parking spots of Hochbahn subsidiary park and ride. Here in Lockstedt, we have to involve the authorities. The key is we had to apply for a right of special use for one year. The German word for that is Sondernutzungsvereinbarung. The two photos on the right show that it is always a question of the combination of a non-parking zone related to a parking zone. This is to prevent the e-scooters from being chaotic and uncontrolled at the station's environment. <clears throat> what did we do in terms of communication to promote our project? We have used a range of different measures, from floor markings and posters in the stations to passenger TV in our metros or short campaigns through our digital channels, as for example, Facebook ads or our website. At this point, I would like to emphasize the idea of incentivization. Customers who park their e-scooter in one of the four parking zones at the metro stations receive five free minutes. This is, according to first impressions, a decisive argument to win customers for the combination of public transport and e-scooters. At the beginning of my presentation, I promised some of our learnings we gained so far. So let's move on to that. 
At the end of February 2022, after nine months of operation, we have already recorded more than 85,000 rides. What is remarkable is that the use of e-scooters depends very much on the weather. The worsening weather in Hamburg during the winter months has caused the user numbers to drop drastically. But however, the absolute figures exceed the expectations of us of Hochbahn and Tia, of course. The second graph shows the distribution of trips, of trips between the different times of the day. Here, our focus is on journeys during the week, from Monday to Thursday. We explicitly exclude the Friday here because we want to promote intermodal travel change and not fun trips at the weekend. We see that the trips are concentrated in the morning and afternoon rush hours, whereas we have a much higher demand in the afternoon than in the morning. The highest demand is during 4 and 5 p.m. The third major finding from the pilot project is that about one third of the e-scooter rides shown here in the graph as first or last mile trips in the two areas Lokstedt and Langhorn are already intermodal. The other two thirds are regular trips, for example, leisure trips, trips for shopping or to the supermarket or the way to school. Last but not least, you see a photo from the project Reality out in the business area Lokstedt on the left. If we would achieve this parking situation over a longer period, um, believe me, we will be very happy. But yesterday's presentations and discussions show that it, not, that it is not always like that. The truth is that these scooters are not so well ordered every day. This only showed that we still have a way to go. Finally, the screenshot on the right shows that we are on a good way. Hamburg Senator for Traffic and Mobility Transition underlines the great importance and potential of e-scooters for the first and last mile and their contribution to the mobility turnaround in history. With this, I would like to come to an end and I'm happy to answer, of course, your questions. Thank you so much, Dominique. Uh, this is a great overview and also a great start into the day. Um, so uh, I, I hear some questions here already. So do feel free to jump in and, and uh, uh, quiz Dominique directly. Maybe I can start. Yeah, go for uh, it. I'm sorry, it's a bit hollow in here. Um, I just received a new house, so sorry for that. Um, so my question is, um, in the presentation of Paris, we saw that around 65%, it was yesterday actually, 65% uh, were parked correctly of the e-kick scooters. Um, I'm not sure if I missed it in the presentation, but do you, can you give a number also for Germany about that? Of the amount of e-scooters which are not parked correctly no actually which are parked correctly which are parked correctly mm -hmm. i do not have any numbers on that Karen, do you have do we have for, for germany or hamburg you mean no i think uh, the difference is that in especially in hamburg we do not have these parking zones like um, um we heard yesterday like in paris and in, in germany and in, in hamburg and um, they all all e-scooters are just parked uh, incorrect more or less because we do not have parking zones but with this project we start to implement these parking zones and i think we have to to see now how it works and how people how disciplined they are and if they really use it okay and the question is always what is being parked incorrect so um there are many many other examples for when the parking zone is not that well ordered as here on this picture so um yeah it's always difficult to, to find a spot for that and in hamburg for example we have that kind of free floating um, operations and many other different cities in germany have that kind of uh, station-based um, approach so that's also uh, different there so just to clarify the picture at, at the left depending on where so the bigger one this is a real life this is this is uh, not staged, but it, uh, well, yes, 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 yes. But it's not the the everyday impression you can get if you walk through the station. Yeah. It was not. Great. Um, I think my, my question yeah. got also yeah. answered. So uh, I was trying to compliment Iris' question. How, to, how, to, how is the enforcement of illegal parking? If it but if it's just starting but i'm really curious because there's something that has been discussing with cities and, and so should they target the operator to ensure that the operator goes after the people or there's some kind of mechanism to actually target the user who actually parks illegally 
these are two different approaches. One is more complex, one is more easier, but gives different incentives. And uh, Claudia, was it you, uh, your question on the uh, August peak? It was a comment by my colleague Laura, but I can ask the question actually. You mentioned that the way that you're, that you're using to convince people or to incentivize people to actually use the parking spots <clears throat> is by giving them three minutes, considering the amount of time that has been parking on the station. Uh, is that the only way you're doing it or is it working or do you have in mind changing the approach a bit? For the beginning, we had some some kind of other incentivization um, models. So, yeah, but we think that the best um, solution for combining public transport and the e-scooter service is to give them an incentive for com for coming to the station, for changing to the public transport system, and so with that three minutes for parking the e-scooter right at the station in the parking zones, that should be. Yeah, the best approach to get that combination. So um, for the moment, this is the only, um, but also the best um, yeah, solution we see there. Okay, great. All oh, right, uh, Matthew just asked on, uh, have you looked into shared ticketing across modes? Yes, that's, um, that's the half of, yeah, sorry. Yeah, ahead. we have discussed that at the beginning of the, oh, just before the launch of the project, but um, as Karen and also Lizina yesterday told us, the HVV, the um, Transport Association in Hamburg, is not that easy structured. So it was difficult for us to, to come along with, um, yeah, combine tickets for public transport and um, the e-scooter e service. So for the moment, it's not that easy to come along with that. It's not possible, but of course we will uh, have that discussions in the future as well. So, but for the moment, no. Because it's a quite an interesting discussion. Maybe we can also follow up in, in the Q and A. But yeah, maybe let's move on to the next. Uh, One last question, Oliver. Yeah, sorry, uh, really yeah. interesting. In the, um, the e scooters are used for the first and last mile, but what kind of distance is this? The the first and last mile. For us, it's more or less um, up to one kilometer in, in the um, first uh, results we have seen. We had a uh, master student he was, uh, who was uh, writing his thesis about, and he um, had the focus on up to one kilometer uh, okay. trips and journeys. Thanks. Yes. Okay, great. Um, uh, then let's move on to the eHubs project. Thank you so much, Dominic. Uh, uh, great presentation, nice discussion. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, we'll focus on scalability and upscaling. Bram, are you with us already? Yes, I am. Here you go. All right, great. Then feel free to uh, share your screen and uh, over to you. Normally, you can see my full screen right now, if that's okay. Looks perfect. Thanks. All right, great. So thank you very much for the invitation, for being here today. Uh, my name is Bram Seus. I work as a policy and project coordinator for autodealer.net. And Autodealer.net uh, is um, a Belgium NGO. And our main goal is actually to promote uh, shared mobility uh, towards end users, uh, potential end users, but also uh, more on a policy level to support municipalities, support Flemish uh, or regional governments, national governments on shared mobility policies. Um, what I will present today is a little bit about uh, the content of the EIPS project, it's a little bit of results, mainly focused on the results from Leuven, which is one of the of the uh, six original uh, partner cities within the project, uh, and then come to some upscaling actions, what we actually uh, are going to do within the capitalization part of the project, because the original EIPS project will end by the end of June, but we uh, submitted the capitalization last year so uh, we will continue with some activities until the uh, September 2023. So um, what is the EFS project about? Uh, the EFS project is actually of what our EFS is a cluster of shared electric uh, mobility modes, uh, really focused uh, to local conditions and needs linked in a network, it can be a public transport network uh, and available in different sizes. Within the project, we uh, came up with a bit of uh, deliverable, uh, defining all different types of e-hubs going from neighborhood hubs to really interregional big hubs. And uh, our main goal is also to integrate this into mass systems. Um, 
our ambition is to have 130, uh, 125 EFs, uh, excuse me, uh, available by the end of the project at 10, 10 different pilot locations. So we had six original partner cities and during the capitalization of the project, we had uh, four new uh, pilot uh, locations, for example, the region of Alunia, uh, the region of Scotland, uh, High Trans, uh, Dublin, uh, were new partners. We want to have more than 2,500 light electric vehicles available at these hubs. We will also come up by the end of June with a, a toolkit for municipalities in order to plan their own e-hubs and also some research results will be launched very soon. This is just an overview of the partners. So we are an Interact Northwest uh, region project, which means that we have partners from Germany, Belgium, Netherlands, France, uh, UK and Ireland. To come with uh, to some results, um, as I said, I, I want to focus on the results from Leuven uh, because it's also in Belgium and we have the, I, we are also uh, the best connection because we are active in Belgium as well with, with Leuven. So, um, what is interesting there um, is that uh, the first one you see, Erby. Erby is one of uh, the project partners. They launched uh, one and a half year ago or two years ago with 26 bikes. Um, and until today, the rides per vehicle uh, are still quite low, so 0.22. Um, number of active users is also uh, like not really big. So that's really something that has to um, yeah, step up if they. Uh, because right now one usage per five days is it's not enough. The cargo bikes uh, they launched a bit recent, more recently, uh, with 30 cargo bikes from Cargo, which is also one of the partners, and the rides per vehicles there is uh, around uh, one trip per two days, which is not bad, but it also has to increase. But uh, I will come back to that later. The blue bike system in Leuven. Um, which is, has been there before the EOS project, of course. Uh, it's linked to the public transport um, system, and they also have around one trip per two days uh, with a fleet size of 124 bikes. And then coming to ca uh, car sharing, there are two car share providers, commercial car share providers, I must say, because there are also some peer-to-peer -peer initiatives in Leuven. And Cambio has around uh, 130 vehicles with a very good uh, rights per vehicle, 1.25, which is in, in car sharing terms speaking, it's a round trip system, uh, which is very high and as it cannot be re much higher, uh, I think, than, one, than this number uh, for this type of car sharing with around 3,400 active users per, um, each month uh, in Leuven, which is a good number. You must know that Leuven has a population of around uh, eight to 200,000 inhabitants, if I'm correctly, and has um, a lot of students as well. It's really a student uh, city. And the last operator is Partago. Partago is a um, electric uh, car share corporation, um, and they have five cars at this moment in Leuven with around uh, 0.5 rides per day and 64 active users, uh, which means 64 um, active uh, corporates of uh, uh, the corporation. Um, to, give, to give you just an idea of, of some more numbers, uh, if we dig into the cargo bike system, for example, we see that the dark blue line uh, is going up. So that means that the total signups is still uh, improving day by day. Although the number of uh, uh, rentals per day per cargo bike has been has been dropping a bit due to two circumstances. First of all, there was uh, a little technical issue with the cargo bikes last summer, and the uh, also due to this, the weather circumstances, uh, it's normal that in winter the cargo bikes are used uh, a bit less than than in uh, during summer times. Uh, but the ambition of the city of Leuven is to continue working with this and also to expand the service with more than 30 bikes. So they will launch a tender for that uh, in the coming months. That brings me to some of the upscaling actions we are trying to do within the, the EOPS project and then hopefully also some future projects. And there, I believe that it's really important that you have a good combination of three things. It's about good infrastructure, good digital integration and good services that are available at the hub. And if you talk about infrastructure, we try to, at least also in Flanders, we try to create accessibility as sort of a transversal objective. So everyone uh, 
disabled persons, everyone uh, should use uh, should be able to use the the e hubs. Uh, at least in Flanders, it is a really high ambition um, to have this uh, possible by let's say in this in four or five years because uh, it's it's a big um, step to take especially if you take it in Flanders case, because we are implementing in Flanders, you have the city of Leuven, but you also have the, the region of Flanders who is promoting uh, mobility hubs very intensively. Um, and there they want to have at least 1000 mobility hubs by 2024 and to have them all um, accessible for everyone, it will take a couple of years. Um, the design has to be based on pedestrians, so really take into account the active users uh, as well in, in designing the hubs. Uh, bike parking is really important. Charging infrastructure for shared cars and also sometimes for private cars and signage, signage uh, which is a branding. Uh, in this case, in Flanders, it's the regional hop-in branding that can be used by municipalities. Surfaces as well, uh, top-down, bottom-up. Um, what, for example, Leuven is doing is to find a combination between the two. To they will for uh, tender uh, for car sharing and bike uh, cargo bike sharing to have more um, cars available, also more electric cars available and uh, bikes in the city. But what they also try to do is come up with bottom-up initiatives to um, support the the local initiatives from neighborhoods which is also something amsterdam for example one of the other project partners uh, lead partner actually is doing um so um amsterdam for example neighborhoods can uh, choose from a menu of shared mobility providers uh, that uh, can start at a, a local mobility hub um and then lastly uh, digital part i think that's just something that has really uh, been in yeah, uh, focus of, of the project in the last couple of months, I must say, is about creating data standards. Um, so the, the EOS project really is working on the TOMP API, which is the connection uh, between mobility providers and, um, and mass platforms. And also on the uh, CDSM standard, which is a European sort of a European translation of the MDS standard, American MDS standard, uh, in order to um, have an automatic data flow, let's say, between uh, mobility, shared mobility providers and um, and uh, the government, uh, the local or regional government. So that's something that we have really been been pushing. Um, what is also interesting is that um, you see some some initiatives all over Europe. It's not really linked to the EFS project, but uh, we sometimes organize like some EFS academies. And I think I saw some participants from last year uh, here as well in, th in this meeting, which is for governments. And there we really get to know what are the, the ongoing initiatives in Europe. And for example, the Yelby, most of you probably know Yelby. I find it really interesting to see how is uh, it linked with mass. Um, also Columbus in, in uh, Stavanger, city of Stavanger in Norway can be seen as such an example. So that's something that we also are following up these initiatives within the project. Uh, another upscaling action, which is also very important, is nudging and communication because I've talked about how loops hubs should be designed and what services, but of course they must be used. And in this case, uh, nudging and communication access, actions are really important. And in and, and the specific case of Leuven, they are now working together with the nudging uh, bureau to uh, come with a really big nudging campaign to convince uh, people of a shared mobility and to really get them on board using the modes, etc. From our side, for example, what we try to do within the project is create uh, Things like a map with all different car share providers give information about the costs. We designed uh, a cost calculator where you compare can compare the costs from uh, uh, a private car compared to the costs uh, from all Belgian car share operators. Uh, and this really helps convincing them um, with uh, with uh, sorry uh, with uh, with uh, with this. Okay. Um, then for uh, last action, I think that is important. Um, just a second, I have to.
sorry, there was someone uh, calling at the door. Um, so the last action uh, is for everyone. And it's also something we are really focusing on within the project is how to make sure that uh, shared mobility modes at the EHUBs are accessible for everyone. And for example, from our part, we have been involved in in a, a local project, it's called Avira, where we, uh, where we did a pilot project on sharing um, uh, wheelchair-friendly wheelchair cars, because these cars are very expensive and it's actually perfect to share. And also the picture on the left is one of the results also from, from a replication area within the EIPS project, where they launched a regional uh, electric car sharing scheme in a rural area uh, in the southeast of Flanders, uh, which is actually working quite well. So also taking the EHUBs to more rural areas is one of the things we want to do within the upscaling part. And this sometimes works. I think the example here in Flanders is, is a good example of that it can work. Uh, it's, it's a co collaboration of 15 municipalities. And I wouldn't say that it's working in all 15 municipalities, but at least in 10 uh, or more than half of the municipalities is really going well. Um, on the other hand, you see that uh, one of the partners in Dreux, they really, uh, in north of France, smaller, uh, a smaller city, they're really pushing car sharing as well, but there it's not working at this stage. So it's something that we also have to take into account. And if you go to rural areas, it's really difficult sometimes to create a good uh, business model for operators. And then lastly, uh, what we try to do also with the upscaling actions is, is also to, to upscale these actions in new uh, projects. And there have been some submitted projects. For example, the Shared iMobia project is a, has been submitted as a follow-up of the EHIPS project. And we are also currently working on an Interact Europe project, uh, which is really focusing on policy around shared mobility to services. And uh, yeah, we are still uh, looking for one or two more partners. So if someone is interested, please give me a call afterwards. So that's it from my side, a short introduction of the project and uh, some of the outputs. And if there are questions, uh, I'm very happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Great overview. Thanks. And uh, we have a question here already by Laura. Would you like to ask it yourself? Yes. Hi, Graham. Thank you for the presentation. It was super interesting. I knew a bit about eHubs, but to to learn like that in all the technical, all of the things that you have done is really nice. And uh, um, I really want to know more about the, what you mentioned of the bottom up approach with the local initiatives. If you have like more examples of thing of how, yeah, of how they could this could happen. Yeah, I, I can tell what Amsterdam, for example, is doing. Um, of course, I'm not the city of Amsterdam, but I know in, in a little bit of what they are doing right now. So um, if I'm correctly, they have sort of a menu. Uh, they tendered, I think, around eight or 10 providers um, uh, in the city and um, citizens that are interested in an e-hub, they can apply for this. Uh, so it's really a neighborhood hub with, let's say, one shared car, uh, one or two cargo bikes, and one or two shared uh, bicycles, depending on what they want. But there is a menu available, and they can choose from it. Um, and these are the operators they can work with. Uh, so in order that they... The, the, the offer that is available is really based on what the inhabitants in that certain area want. Um, what is... One of the things that uh, Amsterdam told me is that they, most of them are like commercial operators. And what they are sometimes looking for is like inhabitants that say, why can't we just uh, not buy a car together and share it with, with some people here in the neighborhood and have a location at the EHUB. And this is not really solved within this menu because um, the operators there are not really into this type of car sharing. Um, in Belgium, we have such types of car sharing uh, with cozy wheels, with, this, with cozy wheels and degage, which is really based on a community-based uh, cost sharing principle. Uh, and I think in the Netherlands, this will also be become a bit more popular, given the fact that in, in this case in Amsterdam there was some demand for such systems, 
why do you don't have uh, to pay to use it? It's just on a cost-based level uh, and you share the car together with, with your uh, friends or neighbors or something like that. So that I can tell about the bottom-up approach. Uh, in Amsterdam, in Leuven, they have been focusing on uh, the bottom-up approach more from the what kind of services also do we want at the hub, um, mostly also the, re the local hubs which uh, I think they have 41 hubs in total. And uh, I think 29 of them were decided by the city and 12 uh, were open for inhabitants to, in a co-creation process to define what do we want, how we do, how does it, do we want uh, some green space, for example, these sort of things. So there it was a combination. I hope that's a little bit an answer to your question. Definitely, thank you, that's great. And it's really great to see all of those initiatives taking place, so nice. Okay, super. We're reasonably okay in time, so we could uh, just behave well and move on in the agenda. But if there is another uh, question, please do feel free to jump in. Nope. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Ram. Much appreciated. And then we're moving over to uh, MobiMix. And... Um, focus on assessing the impact of shared mobility using the mode framework and Albert Gragera from Bucks and Company is joining us. In. Here you go. Okay, Albert, over to you. I'll try to share my screen. Let's see. Okay. I need you to tell me whether you are seeing the full screen mode or the, the other, <laughs> yeah. it's the other. Yeah. The other. It always happens the same. <laughs> now you should be seeing the perfect. The, yeah. The, okay. Perfect. So hi everyone. Uh, my name is Albert Herrera. I'm a mobility consultant at Pax and Company, and there I'm involved in in helping uh, mobility stakeholders. I would say to assess uh, the impact of different mobility solutions, and I'm going to present you today this new methodology that we have developed uh, within the the Mobimix project. The uh, you might be wondering why do we need a new method to to assess uh, mobility impacts of these shared solutions? And so far, I think that within this um, this event. It has been made clear that cities can either make or break uh, shared mobility implementation in in their in their areas. Uh, companies often ask cities for some favorable treatment, um, either by park providing free parking spaces, some subsidies, uh, and many cities seem kind of hesitant uh, to adopt certain solutions. So, uh, pr mostly because uh, private companies are using public space. And usually they also, there is some lack of data and somehow mixed evidence on the benefits of each of these shared solutions. So the idea for this method is to actually assess the social benefits of shared mobility solutions so we can provide an evidence-based uh, decision-making um, and, and, and help cities with the, with the policy formulation. And, the idea is to do so in a, in a more in the most credible and robust uh, way. So what we apply is uh, what is called causal inference that maybe some of you might might know if you have been following the the last um, Nobel Prize uh, award that was specifically um, awarded for this the the implementation of these new techniques that are um, told to be kind of the the credibility revolution in the social sciences. So um, we apply this uh, impact assessment to the different pilots ongoing in the five partner cities within Moimix. I will show you just here two couple of cases, a couple of case studies, because the other ones are, are ongoing. You know, the pandemic might have delayed some things and, and we are still gathering the data for some of these pilots that have just uh, started. So um, what's what this method about, we developed a sequential method that is trying to provide insights at each uh, project phase, adapting the method to the level of information or the detail that arises at each of these steps. The idea is that we go from conception to pre-design to actual deployment and assessment of, of trial solutions. So um, we can even assess um, changes in 
already introduced uh, solutions. It's not something that is just applicable to greenfield projects, but to, to any type of projects. And you, you will see in a minute why. Uh, the thing is that in this first um, phase, uh, we call it like the exploratory evaluation. This is based just on case studies. Imagine that you have not implemented any solution in your city. You're just thinking about doing so. So uh, which are the impacts that you can expect for that specific solution in your city? So in a sort of meta regression fashion, we adapt the, the available evidence from case studies applied elsewhere and try to transfer that to uh, your specific uh, area. Um, obviously, not all studies are, are made the same, and there is some, some uh, variability. Uh, and what we constructed is an impact repository from which we can draw the, the impacts for, for different analysis, like uh, trying to match the case studies to your specific, um, specific setting, context, or, or, or mobility ecosystem. Uh, you can see here uh, a couple of examples of that kind of data that we have. I'm just showing you uh, the, the average uh, impact uh, on travel uh, behavior or change from different modes to uh, e-scooters. And on the right side, you will see the, the reduction on, on car ownership introduced by, by car sharing uh, methods. And you see here the dashed lines are just the dispersion um within the, of those impacts uh for a 95 percent confidence interval so you see that there is some uncertainty that we can also take into take into account when we move to the exam evaluation now that you have sort of decided okay we go for it <laughs> we will try to implement this specific uh solution and and, and trial it in our in our city the idea is that with this exam evaluation we undertake a, a survey aiming at gathering the responses for both potential users and non-users. Uh, obviously, this in collaboration with the, with a shared mobility provider that you're trying to, to, to set up there. So the idea is that from here, we can get like user profiles and the potential demand or the intended impact on how uh, people report that they will change their behavior once this, once this solution is implemented. This survey, generally speaking, it, it just uh, gathers information on the socioeconomic characteristics of the respondents, their vehicle ownership levels, uh, their attitudes towards shared mobility and cars in general, and also the, like the, the, the big part of the, of the survey is a, is a travel diary for a, a full week. So um, the idea with this is that um, this is a first round of the survey so we will have um, we will gather the emails of those respondents um, as a unique identifier for them, and the idea would be to um, track them in in a in a follow up survey, so we can actually measure from this ex ante to the ex post analysis, which is actually the, the the behavioral change. In this first stage. What we will do is include some uh, questions here in the in this travel uh, diary about how much they intend to change each of the trips they report for this new solution. So we can have like an idea of uh, even before implementing the the solution uh, how much do they are willing to to modify their behavior. So uh, going real quick. Um, I will show you um, the preliminary results we have we had for this uh, couple of uh, case studies. The first one is uh, the Norfolk uh, shared e-scooter pilot. And what we do here with the data we gather so far is like two different things. We try to assess who would join this shared e-scooter service. And you see here uh, a bunch of uh, sort of preliminary conclusions. Uh, what we see is that men are uh, quite more likely to join this type of uh, solutions and also that younger citizens are, are the ones leading uh, the adoption of such a solution, especially below uh, 40 years old, with a market decrease in the chance uh, of uh, older groups uh, joining the, the solution. What do you see here is like probabilities. Like you see when you see that if this 70% uh, higher probability for men, for instance, and what we also assessed is that uh, those that are more 
prone to join uh, the this uh, e-scooter service are those that are more intensely using individual mobility modes especially bikes and cars okay this is uh, for each standard deviation above uh, the mean that you, the number of vehicle kilometers travel uh, per week that you do by bike or by car you're uh, 13 or 9 percent uh, more likely to join uh, this type of solution and and one thing that is detrimental for the adoption of this solution is whether they those um, respondents have uh, employer paid parking which quite quite reduces the the likelihood of them joining this type of solution you see that as you see below there are other characteristics that make no difference so far with the sample that that we have and extrapolating the results for this uh, for this model what we see is that the the potential demand for the e-scooter service in Norfolk would be somewhere around uh, 100,000 uh, total users when we do then the analysis at the trip um, on a trip basis like analyzing all each of the trips that those uh, respondents do. Um, we try to look at uh, how they intend to change their behavior for those specific trips. And what we see is that uh, public transport trips are the ones more likely to be substituted by e-scooters with lower chances for, for walking and, and car use and no change for, for, bike, uh, for bike trips. However, this is not that bad. If we look at the average vehicle kilometer shifted, uh, as you see in the sidebar on, on the right, as, as it means that as car trips are longer, in the end, you, you end up reducing more vehicle kilometers from cars than from any other uh, mode. So the, the carbon reduction that you get from it is, is, is still uh, quite positive. So um, other characteristics of the trips do also make some difference, like uh, distance or, or frequency that both negatively affect the chances that the trip is substituted by, by e-scooters. And we see also that the trip purpose that is like most easily swapped for this um, solution is le our leisure trips. And, and you see that uh, the probability for different um, age groups are also lower, especially for the for the older ones. And moving to the to the Rotterdam uh, car sharing pilot, we did exactly the same. You will see that here things look uh, quite different. Uh, car ownership is, is a major deterrent for car sharing, for joining a car sharing service. Uh, the more cars you have, the less likely are you to join this type of uh, solution, which kind of goes against uh, what we would like to see. Uh, and based on mobility patterns, uh, heavy walking, bike and transit users uh, are also the ones more likely uh, to join this solution. What we see here is what we call uh, car sharing being a, a sort of a mobility insurance for those um, users, probably not, not having a car. So the, having the opportunity to, to, to join this kind of solution, it's, it, it's broadens their, their mobility uh, opportunities. So um, with this model uh, and also taking like other uh, socioeconomic characteristics, we assess that the total potential demand for car sharing uh, solutions in Rotterdam is somewhere about uh, 117,000 uh, users. When we look again at the trips um, individually and like uh, pulling them together, trying to assess which is how much uh, users intend to change uh, those trips. What we see is that specifically those um, use, using those trips that are done walking, uh, biking, or, or uh, by public transport are the ones that are less likely to be substituted by car sharing. In the contrary to what we have seen before, those. Uh, heavy uh, sustainable urban mobility modes are more likely to join, but they are less likely to substitute their trips for uh, for cars, for car sharing cars. Okay, and we see no difference for for car trips. Where we see that a, a big difference is that um, 
the probability of uh, changing uh, taxi uh, for car sharing is quite high. Okay, and we see also that uh, the probability of changing this car sharing uh, trip is it increases with the distance of the trip. It, it's uh, zero point four percent higher for each additional kilometer uh, you travel, and but it makes no difference for uh, the the amount of the, the frequency with what you do this this type of trip. And looking at the at the trip purpose that are more likely to be switched to this um, solution, we see that are those like non-regular trips, the ones more likely to be substituted, that it's leisure, shopping, uh, taking care of someone and, and so on, like visiting friends and family and other, other, other trip purpose. And also that they, the older groups are the ones that show uh, somewhat a, a, a lower a lower probability to, to substitute their their trips and we see here in, in the graph in the in the right you see that here the 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 total vehicle kilometers uh, switched uh, with comparing different modes the, this is much much closer than before but still um, car trips that are substituted for car sharing it, it implies a, a, a larger amount of vehicle kilometer shift than any other uh transport mode so moving at for the the last part that that is what we have been doing so far the exploratory evaluation and the exact evaluation at least for these two case studies and we have to repeat that for the for the rest of the cities what we will do in the in the next round some cities are starting to to look at this second round survey to to launch it and the idea behind that is actually measuring the the actual user profile and how much they are they are changing their their behavior and i will show you the the reasoning behind that and why we need this this last uh, step the ex post evaluation what we usually have in in studies is that they kind of compare simply what happened before the implementation with what happens after the implementation and it has some problems because uh, here we are not using like uh, we do when we test the, eff the effectiveness of vaccines for instance we are not in a lab like people can self-select whether they take this uh, shared mobility solution or not we are not randomly applying okay they 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 join voluntarily this type of services so what we would see is that we are trying to compare users with general population usually and then we compare them before and after but this has a problem is that this population as you see here um, users are a sub-segment of those population and they might have some specific characteristics that do not match the ones of the general population the meaning is that they are self-selecting into our our shared mobility solution and what we need to do to actually measure the impact that it's not like this uh, huge amount comparing the after uh, population level of any kpi of interest might be the vehicle kilometers traveled by car or whatever we have we are interested in but comparing them with the control population that would be a subset of this uh, total population but that are the closest uh, possible uh, to users. I mean, the only difference between the control group and users, they are virtually the same. The only difference is that users ended up joining the, the shared mobility solution we are trying to assess, to, to assess the impact for. And the control group is just the very same kind of people or users, but they ended up not joining. So what we see here is that we compare the, the difference, the change in behavior between the two groups, actually um, implying that we see what would have happened to users if they ended up not joining. That would be kind of the same that happens to the control group, is that we see this, this parallel line here um, transferred to the users. So the actual impact is just this difference that you see uh, highlighted here. So this is more or less what I had to, to tell you. You can find further information uh, for this mode framework in following this QR here, or just hit me with an, uh, with an email if you want any further information on this.
Great. Thank you very much. This is this is really helpful and a very uh, uh, interesting and applicable methodology. Um, so do feel free to jump in and uh, throw questions at, at, Brown, at Albert. Uh, I don't see any in the chat just yet. So we're still digesting. Can I, can yeah, I Pedro, just, go ahead. Yeah, just a quick question and observation. Yeah, well, it was really, really interesting to see the case of, of Rotterdam. Mm -hmm. You clearly see that was a shift from taxi to the shared vehicles, to the tri trips uh, related to healthcare services, for example. So I can imagine that it's possibly elderly people who used to go to the hospital for consultations or exams or whatever. And mm -hmm. now they, or, or people who brought elderly people, now they can use the car shared service instead of the taxi, which probably saves them a lot of money. Yeah, it looks like they are trying to substitute these like non-regular trips that are more convenient if you do they by car. Really interesting results, I have to see. Maybe one sort of, Obvious question, but you know, just interesting if you could reflect on this. So you're applying this, but I suppose back in the days or maybe in other projects, you also apply other frameworks. How do you see this one being, you know, creating uh, results that are maybe different if you were to be applying other methodologies? Mm -hmm. Well, this, this framework kind of... Um started from this uh, Civitas evaluation framework. I know if you are aware of it, that they are proposing that we move towards this causal inference. This, is, this would be in the following years, kind of the golden standard that we all will be asked to fulfill. <laughs> and what we are trying to do is to specifically apply those techniques to shared mobility, which has this, it, the problem is that you, you cannot control things in, in a lab. Here, we, as, as I mentioned before, uh, people self-select into voluntarily join those kind of solutions. And there are many different techniques that you can apply to, to actually assess the impact, but all of them go kind of in this pipe that you are control, you are comparing your user group with the closest possible uh, counterpart to actually measure how they are, um, how they are changing. The, th the thing is that probably um, in this method, we have been focusing on surveys, okay? There is no need to focus on surveys. You, it, it depends on the question you're asking for. For instance, uh, before with uh, Ochban, uh, they, they were suggesting this, okay, how these shared uh, mobility solutions like e-scooters are complements or substitutes for, for this um, public transport. So the idea is that you, using data, a data-driven approach with some sort of the same um, reasoning behind what I've shown is, is perfectly doable uh, without doing any sort of survey. Okay, the, the type of question you can answer is different, but <laughs> at, at the end of the day, it's more or less the same. Super. Thank you. And we're really, we're super well behaved this morning. Maybe we were getting out of hint later in the morning, but uh, so far we're doing super full time. Any any other questions for, for Albert? Uh, Lorena has one in the chat. Ah, yeah, here we go. Okay. Yeah, Lorena, feel free to. Yeah, thank you. I was just wondering if these uh, results um, were what the cities of Rotterdam and Norfolk were expecting. So it's not really a question for Albert because I see Albert most of the days, <laughs> but more for, uh, I think, Stefan, Iris, and Matt and Chris are here from the cities of Norfolk and Rotterdam. Yeah, we've already um, seen this uh, results um, in the beginning of this year. So uh, we discussed this also internally. Um, and yeah, we were a little bit surprised. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think um, from Norfolk, what's really interesting is um, we were a bit worried that we were going to get a lot of trips just to place from, um, you know, public transport and walking trips with these scooters. And I think looking at this, actually, it's provided quite a good case of actually where it sits within the wider mobility framework. And I think what we're seeing here is really useful examples of how it kind of fits as multimodal trips. 
Um, but yeah, it's, it's showing actually how it could be scaled up as well, because we've, you know, we've just got a pilot at the moment, which is quite small, um, but it is doing really well. We're getting you know, over, over four usage per vehicles on our e-scooters at the moment. So it's definitely got a lot of demand, but it's actually providing that kind of bit more detail on actually how it could be scaled up and actually the, the mode shift it could create. So it's really useful. All right. Thanks for the clarification. That's that's super. And um, so uh, we've uh, deserve uh, a tiny little coffee break, and uh, we will reconvene at uh, ten twenty, uh, and uh, then we'll jump into the physical integration. See you in a minute, or yeah. fifteen actually. All right, uh, the break sign is off, which uh, means we're back to work. Good to see you all again. Um, and now we look into the physical integration and we'll start uh, with a presentation from SBB on uh, pilot to integrate in train stations. And uh, with us from SBB, uh, bonus one is, Jan von Lantem. So, Jan, over to you. Thank you very much, Oliver. Um, hello, also from my side. I hope you can all see my screen. Um, otherwise, give me a sign. Um, my, my name, as you just said, Jan von Lanten. I'm a project manager for the first and last mile department at the Swiss Railway Company. Um, I've got the honor today to speak to you about our approach of integrating uh, the shared mobility at our train station physically. So first, let me lose a few words about uh, our company. So the SBB, the Schweizerische Bundesbahn, and its first last mile department, which I work for, and how we tackle the first mile um, as a public transport company. Um, Swiss. Railway companies is basically the backbone of the Swiss public transport system. We connect people, goods and places, bringing millions of people together and linking up cities, cantons and rural areas as well. As you can see here, it compromises the business areas of passenger services, production and markets. We also have a real estate department, infrastructure and freight services. Before Corona, we transported around 1.3 million uh, Trans passengers each day in a country of 8.6 million inhabitants, which is quite a big number. Um, as you see, it dropped uh, substantially now uh, after Corona's, but the figures are going up again. So we hope for the best that people are coming back to public transport as well. Um, you can also see that Swiss people really regularly use our services. We have uh, around 400,000 GA subscriptions um, sold. These are subscriptions which um, provide unlimited travel for public transport in whole Switzerland. And around 2.8 million people have a whole fake card, which is a yearly subscription as well, so that you pay less for public transport. So Swiss people are really engaged, engaged to public transport and also to our company. And that's what, what we're proud for. Um, part let me talk about about the future of of, of SBB and, and the strategy we we have and part of this strategy is actually to seamlessly link different forms of mobility in order to increase the attractiveness of the rails so as we all know u trip does not start and does not end at train stations so we want to support our customers on their way to and from the station towards their final destination and here our goal is to play uh, the role as a mobility integrator for partners and to display their offers of shared mobility physically and in the future also digitally. So with this strategy, we want to make public mobility, so not public transport, but public mobility more attractive with regard to the car. So the goal is to shift car use partially for the first or the last mile and then to take the train um, or um, even better completely towards public mobility. However, the first, la la first last mile department, so we, we're just a tiny bit in this. 
the train, so the public transport itself must provide a really reliable and comfortable uh, service as well. Because without that, everything, everything breaks down because you cannot take uh, a long distance trip just by um, a shared bike or so. Today you can see uh, what we do at our department. Um, we take care of the parking services on the train station because this is also part of the first last mile for private vehicles. Um, plus in cooperations with mobility providers, we search for approaches to expand offers and the increased use of shared mobility. So all this, um, all these themes you can see here are part of our <clears throat> department. So enough um, of this, let me now talk about uh, our approach to integrate shared mobility, mobility physically at our train station. But first, no, it doesn't click, so. But first, let me, let me quickly explain why do we even care? So why do we, why do we care how shared mobility is, is, is provided at our train station? Well, that's why um, we really want to avoid pictures like this and situations like this where people in a wheel, wheelchair can't access our train station anymore. And, and it's just a complete mess in front of our train stations. So we would like to find a way of how we can organize shared mobility, especially also free floating, um, in a structured and proper way around our train station. Here, however, we also depend, of course, a lot of, uh, on the operators and especially on their customers. Another reason is also safety, um, especially near train station where lots of people come together and often are in a hurry. Um, it is really crucial to, to make sure everyone is safe and not just that you cannot just ride with a scooter on 20, um, 20 kilometers an hour and rush, rush through the station. Another aspect is there's a lot of pressure on bike parking, um, especially on train station. We're not yet that far as our um, colleagues from, from Holland, especially where they have huge um, velo, velo parking on the ground and making our way there. But still now we still have a lot of pressure and here we believe that shared mobility can actually help to reduce this pressure um, as well. Um, we also have a lot of rusty old bikes are just, we're just there at the train station, which are used once every month or so. And here we really think that shared mobility could, um, could be a way to, to get rid of these rusty old bikes at our train stations. And last but not least, a um, very important aspect as well is we want to provide customers orientation of where they can find their last, uh, first last mile offers. Especially when you're in a new city and you don't know where the next um, shared bike is, um, you, we have to give you a, a hint or an orientation where you can find it. So let me introduce you what we did so far or what you still do um, in, in order to, to tackle this, uh, these challenges. So to integrate um, different mobility providers physically at our train station, we didn't actually do anything really fancy. So first um, we tried to, to find a suitable place for a first pilot, as you will see in the next picture. And then on the one side, we, on the one side, we set up uh, contracts with mobility provider, which are, which were operating in this area. And we el elaborated some governance criteria of how to behave at our train stations. And on the other hand, we came up with a toolbox of different elements of street furniture, um, which are then independent, which, which can be used independent of the mobility provider. Um, because we also have uh, different forms of shared mobility, so they all have to fit in. With these elements as an information pillar and marking on the ground and different elements, we kind of made a toolbox which we can take what we need because every, um, every station is also quite different. So the first plan looked like this. Um, that's our first pilot zone we, we, we did in Zurich with some mock-up ele element first. And that, that's what it looked in, in reality. Um, we impl implemented it with partners. Um, of course, I have to be honest with you, unfortunately, it didn't always look that nice as on the picture. Um, we had a lot of challenges um, with, with private vehicles and other stuff as well. But as you will see, and the general idea of working it as a hub and structure it 
um, worked actually quite well. Then we, a bit later, we planned another zone without the mock-ups anymore, um, but with the kind of real elements. And then we, we had this two station in Zurich um, as a pilot. After that, we really wanted to know if the hubs had an impact on customer behavior and if it worked or not. So we had a closer look on the data um, we, we received from the, from the partners. And we could see that 20% um, of the arrivals ended at our hubs, which is quite a good um, number we thought because um, we really looked at the whole area of the train station. You can see it here in the, the yellow bit. So it is Zurich and we took the whole area around the train station and everywhere it was possible to drop off um, the free floating vehicles. And we only had two stations, one here, the big one and the other one, small one here. And 20% of all these trips ended at the hub. The departure of course were even better. Here we had 50% um, of the departures with, which uh, took off at one of our hubs. Yeah, however, during this first implementation of implementations, of course, um, we encountered many challenges and learned a lot because it was the first kind of zone like this in a very dense um, area where a lot of people come together and a lot of mobility services are. But first, as you just saw, the zone actually delivered the desired effect of bundling arrivals and departures. Um, we also saw that geofencing really is key. Um, especially at one station, we didn't have geofencing. So it was, yeah, it was really hard to get people um, to park there. Um, when, you have, when you have partners which are reliable, they're at least they drop off the vehicles where they should. But of course, we only had a contract with two partners and there are a lot of others, other providers as well, which were not part of our contract. So sometimes it was a bit mess, messy, but as soon as you, as, as you implement really good geofencing, which in the future should become even more precise, I hope. Um, it, it really is possible to, to structure also around train station shared mobility as it, uh, as it should. Um, as I already mentioned, we also um, had issues with private vehicles at our sharing zone, and we had very, very limited possibilities to act against them. Um, so make sure that if you set up such a zone, um, private bikes can at least not be locked at your, at, at your zone. We now made some adjust, adjustments, so, and now it, worked, it works actually quite good. Um, next point is, um, it's not always the best way just to provide sharing zones. Sometimes it, it doesn't make sense if you don't have lots of different providers or um, you have to only a little so, and I will show you some pictures at the end, how we, how we deal with, with that and in, in smaller, other and smaller train stations. And last but not least, um, <clears throat> to find um, appropriate, and I mean, really appropriate space, not somewhere um, in a, at the end of the train station. So you really have to find appropriate space is not very easy. Um, so the best is that, we all have to plan for such zones conceptually when building or renovating train station or public spaces in general really have to think with um, the shared mobility where it's going to, to to be parked because without this it's really getting hard to find appropriate space on on, on such areas so with these zones we developed, developed uh, and some others that followed um, after these two, we, we now want to pursue on three fields of action um, in the future with our sharing zones. We want to offer zones where there's an actual need. So we don't just want to place uh, sharing zones anywhere because um, they look nice and, they, and it's, we really want to see or to, to look for a train station where it makes sense and where they, they have an actual use. We also want to build up um, our know-how of how zones must be planned. We still kind of, of are in a pilot phase. So we, we're not done with our elements and with our market <coughs> ground market yet. yet. So we want to, to build up the, the know-how further and also sharing the knowledge and experience we made uh, with others and especially with municipalities we want, which want to implement shared mobility 
and here we here we really here to help as a as a public jump company as well because we already made some some experience with that so let's have a look um, at our next step we have an a project which is located located in basel where we have uh, where we want to to integrate a new bigger sharing zones the goal is to integrate seven different providers so here um, we really want to take everybody in because for us it's very important to integrate different forms of shared mobility and not only one um, in switzerland we have the luck especially here in basel that we also have pedelecs so e-bikes which are which support up to 45 kilometers an hour and as a public uh, transport company for us, this is very interesting because then we cannot just substitute walking uh, pedestrian walks or or public transport uh, public transport within cities as, uh, itself. But we can also focus on, or people can also focus on longer distance distances for the first and last mile. However, this will still take a while. Um, something a bit more actual is, is this new zone just besides the train station in Basel as well and this zone we will actually set up in, in two weeks and we are we're curious to see how it how it develops um, it will be a challenge because here we have six different providers as well um, but it's really a nice spot just beside the train station and we will see how it how it goes so and let me just finish with uh, with this slide um, Especially if you just have one provider, as I already mentioned, it's it's really no big deal. You don't have to do something fancy. I mean, in Basel and Zurich, we really have to create public space, and then it's something different. But if you just have one provider, um, it's really no big deal. Just provide dedicated space to them. It it really helps to 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 organize the shared mobility. So thank you very much uh, for your attention, and feel free if you have any questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much. We can pick some questions now. We can also use them on block um, after. So do feel free. Yeah, Lorena. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I was wondering, how did the providers accept the docs? Was it straightforward or was there any sort of discussion in between? No, actually, the provide we didn't have any discussions with the provider about the docs. They were we proposed uh, to them and they hadn't any issues actually they're quite straightforward um as they all also have so all, so their own uh, racks they were kind of kind of similar it mm -hmm. just gives a nice kind of organization of how they should be stored that's that's actually all and uh if i understood well you designed them or the city designed them and they were installed by the city so the providers did not have to contribute in any way Exactly, the, the, they didn't have to contribute anyway. Actually, we as a public transport company installed them and set them up. Yes, exactly. But we are also in contact with the cities, of course. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Super. Laura? Thank you. Thank you, Jan, for the presentation. It was very nice. You mentioned that you only, uh, you only set up this mobility, this mobility hubs, these services when there is a need. So my question is, how do you measure this need? How do you assess this? Do you have surveys or how do you know what the travelers need and how to move it forward? Well, there, there are different aspects. Um, as we are organized as asked for me that in every train station, there's kind of a responsible person for, for, for the whole spot. And often they come to us and see, hey, we really have a lot of shared mobility. Um, do we have a solution for that? Or they already know from, from other train stations. So that's, that's a hint from us. And also, of course, we check um, how the shared mobility develops around whole Switzerland. So we see if, if a provider of different com providers come up in, in a new city, and then we see, wow, here are already four different providers and it's not really looking good around the trade station. So let's do something. So it's really with, with the contact of, uh, of, of local people um, and then to, to, to see how it, how it goes, because there are also train stations where there's really no need for such stations because it really kind of naturally came, came out fine. Thank you. That's very interesting. It's very similar to what Bram mentioned before about taking it from local and seeing what is, what's happening on the ground. 
So thank you. That's very nice. Thank you. Fantastic. All right, then let's move on to the presentation from Tier um, on the integration to public transport and the alignment with the city objectives from an operator's perspective. Um, Pauline is yes. with that. Yes. Hi, Oliver. Good there morning, go. everyone. Sorry, should I share my slides directly? Sure. Okay. Yeah, we'll see that. Oops. Yep. Oh. Yeah. Does that work? Okay. Perfect. Brilliant. Um, <clears throat> hi, everyone. Um, my name is Pauline. I'm the head of public policy at Tier for Smart and Sustainable City. Um, and today, well, it's a pleasure to be with you all. And I will be discussing Tier's vision for public transport integration and mass. Um, there will be, um, you know, a part focusing on physical integration, but the presentation will be a bit more. And kind of broader in integrating uh, various concepts. So <clears throat> as an introduction, so um, I suppose most of you um, probably know us. Um, so we are a the leading global micromobility operator and we operate a fleet of e-scooters, e-bikes and e-mopeds um, across 170 cities um, across the globe. And um, what we're striving to do at the moment um, is really to further build our experience with being, um, you know, a trusted partner of our public transport operators. So we have built um, about 50 partnerships um, with public transports, um, primarily across Europe, um, in 10 countries. And we have also um, integrated in over 40 mass um, integrations across the globe, uh, making us the most integrated operator to date. Um, and 60% of um, those integrations are actually, uh, mass integrations are actually done with uh, public transport as well. And they spread across 70 um, cities. So, so what are objectives for mass and public transport partnerships? Well, we believe that our objectives very much align with that of public transport partnership, uh, public transport operators. And that's really why we're trying to um, do a lot more work with that, with our partners. What we strive to do is to create an, an attractive and multimodal alternative to the private car and thereby reducing pollution, traffic, congestion in cities. We want to complement and expand the reach of public transport, which we consider as being, of course, the backbone of our transportation networks. Um, overall, what we strive to do is to change mobility for good. And how we want to do that is through efficient and innovative public-private partnerships with public transport companies with mass operators. And so, you know, overall, as I said, our primary goal is to ex expand intermodality. And what we see from our users already in, in, in the user surveys that we run um, in our various markets is that 50% of our users have indicated that they already combine shared mobility with public transport or other forms of um, transportation, which is very, a very promising results that, um, you know, really presents the opportunity to better complement shared mobility with public transport. So how do we actually, what's our approach? How do we actually try to implement these objectives? Well, through public transport partnerships and mass partnerships, we strive to rethink urban transport holistically. We believe that this is a great opportunity that multimodality offers to us. <clears throat> we try to provide cities with a more holistic approach to urban transport, but also greater visibility on the performance of urban transportation, notably thanks to our data. We try to rethink the traditional structures of our mobility system. We want to kind of shift away from a siloed and mode approach, mode specific approach and type of planning um, that's been very much used to date um, by looking at various modes of transport jointly and all through also through various kind of socioeconomic lenses. And on the chart on the right here is really how we define um, our public transportation uh, partnership approach, which we believe goes through four different lenses of digital integration, physical, commercial, and social integration. So how does that actually translate in practice? The first layer is really digital, right? So this means us integrating our services with other transport modes um, in apps, allowing users to plan, to book, to pay for their trips using a single application. 
The next level um, for successful integration is in our view, and that we've discussed earlier um, with um, uh, SBB's presentation, is physical integration. We believe it's key to use physical to encourage the use of more sustainable multimodal travel by integrating modes not only in digital infrastructure, but also in physical. We believe that um, multimodality to work needs to be seen and experienced by citizens, and physical is key for that. The third le uh, level of integration is commercial. We believe that a combined usage and payment of different mobility modes via, for example, intermodal packages, bundles, are a prerequisite to offer an alternative to the private car. We need to make um, multimodality attractive to the end user and also whilst keeping uh, public transport as the backbone of these offers. And finally, the last um, integration level for us is social tool, and that can very much take various forms. One form, for example, is to use dynamic user incentivization and nudging towards greener modes of transport, depending, for example, on criteria such as pollution levels, congestion, etc. And essentially, this framework um, that we use is really align, um, allows us to make sure that our goals aligns with that of public transport operators of our cities, that we're not just integrating digitally um, in an app, but rather that we're taking into consideration various components for, you know, a successful integration and again, looking at transport more holistically. So how do we implement that in practice? Well, we have built a modular and goal oriented partnership approach based on the broader vision um, for urban transportation that I've just set out in the previous slide. Um, so we try to offer those different, um, I mean, we can offer these modules um, separately um, to various partners. Nevertheless, we very much assessed and learned that um, the greatest synergies can be created in public transport um, partnerships when those different modules are used in combination. And so what are those modules? So on the digital side, as I said, we've got mass integrations, integrating um, our services in partners apps. On the physical side of things, we um, build dedicated parking hubs or support um, our public transport partners with rolling out those dedicated parking hubs. On physical also, we um, co-launch uh, a number of marketing initiatives, um, for example, to co-brand our vehicles with the public transport logos, to promote intermodality and make intermodality kind of known and accepted by the users. When we look at commercial um, on um, the left and bottom, um, as I said, we have ruled out a number of joint ticketing and bundles initiative, as well as an offer that we call Tier Connect, which essentially is a long-term discount um, for subscribers of local public transports. And finally, on social tool, the main initiative that we've trialed um, to date is better connecting um, cities' outskirts with our mobility offer um, so that we're able to, um, you know, maybe fill a mobility gap in areas that are sometimes difficult to reach through public transport only. And I will go in a bit more detail in the various um, kind of uh, modules of this approach. So when we look at mass integrations, what do we do exactly? Essentially, we support public transport companies and also private mass operators by integrating our tier services into their app via API integration. Um, so this has been, those mass pilots and partnerships, um, both with private and public operators have been really successful to date. And we have actually assessed that we have um, encouraged and enabled 750,000 trips um, already, and they were facilitated through mass integrations in 2021, which is a very promising result. And essentially, we offer two different degrees of integration, depending on the partner's needs, on the capacity, uh, capabilities that they have available for the integration. The first one is what we call deep link integration, and that's the kind of first level integration really. What it does is that we share our data to showcase the location, battery status and price of our vehicles to be displayed on our partners apps. For booking and payment nevertheless, we need to jump and there needs to um, yeah, be a link that goes back to our tier app um, to actually book um, our services. The second integration level um, that we very much prefer and try to push for is what we call deep integration, um, because that allows for the booking and the payment of tier vehicles to be fully integrated in the partner app. There is no need to jump back to the tier app, which, as you can imagine, makes for a much smoother um, user experience. 
And most importantly, by doing deep integrations, we have the possibility of offering mobility bundles and budget to customers, which, as I pointed out earlier, we believe is very key to make mass, um, you know, more adopted by users. Now, moving on to commercial, as I mentioned, we essentially try to find ways to better integrate our offer with public transportation. And we do that via an integration of ticketing and fares. Um, so it was one of the first micromobility operators to actually combine public transport tickets with micromobility services in one single transaction. Um, and the research and analysis that we've run from this pilot have proved extremely promising. And essentially, so, you know, Rolling out joint ticketing pilots is very much bound to legislation um, and it's not allowed everywhere in Europe, um, but we do see it as very key to making multi-modality and mass an attractive alternative to urban car usage. So what we've done in practice, um, we have provided joint ticketing and bundles in two situations. The first one in the tier app. What we've done is offer a combination of integrated public transport tickets and tier tickets um, into kind of packages that are sold directly in our tier app shop. We have launched two pilots um, on this, one in Helsinki and one in Dusseldorf. And as I said earlier, we've got some very... Um, positive results from that. So looking at the pilot we ran with HSL in Helsinki, for example, what we saw is that 70, so, sorry, 67% of all the tier packages that were sold during the pilot period were actually the PT bundles that were sold in our app. What we also saw is that um, the repurchase rate of these bundles were quite, was quite high. It was above um, 50%, meaning that customers didn't only buy it once, but several times, indicating that um, you know, there's great appetite for these types of bundles, really. And the second situation in which um, we've um, piloted joint ticketing in bundles is in our mass partners app directly. So we, what we've done is integrate our services into mobility bundles and mobility subscriptions provided directly by the mass partner. And so we've launched two pilots um, with mass partners, one with UMove in Switzerland um, and one with WIM in Finland. And in the Swiss pilot, what we've seen is that 50% of all rides um, that were taken um, in the pilot period were taken by the bundle users, which was also extremely promising. And um, a university research that accompanied um, this bundle pilot indicated that bundle users um, essentially used public transport more after purchasing the bundle, which is a very, I think, interesting relationship to, to draw. Um, still on ticketing and bundles, I wanted to talk about um, an offer that we've designed at Tier, uh, which is called Tier Connect. And what it is exactly? Well, with Tier Connect, we essentially allow public transport subscribers to use Tier at discounted rates. So how does it work in practice? Essentially, we get PT subscription numbers that are shared by our partners and that we convert into unique Tier voucher codes for the users. What we do is that partners can communicate this offer to their users via different channels to, you know, advertise it. And then users can use the redeem code in our tier app directly to get access to the discounts. The benefits that we've um, assessed from this is an increased attractivity of public transport subscription. We've also seen that um, TakeNet essentially has made public transport more accessible um, and also allows public transport to get access to a new customer base from our tier user base. Um, and finally, also, we've tried to build a solution in a way that is, well, easy to implement for our partners and that is scalable across various markets. And so more from a kind of research perspective, we have run um, various surveys in um, well, markets and cities where we have launched the Tier Connect offer, um, especially, well, six pilot cities in Germany and in France. And what we've seen is, as I said, Tier Connect increases intermodal journeys. Essentially, 80% of the respondents to our surveys um, indicated that they increased the intermodality of their trip through Tier Connect by combining um, public transport with our tier services. Another kind of lessons learned was that Tier Connect increases the value of public transport subscription. Indeed, 84% of the respondents that we surveyed um, indicated that Tier Connect increases the value of their public transport subscription. 
And yeah, this is a solution that we um, have piloted so far um, in a few cities and that we're very keen to roll out um, together with our public transport partners um, globally. Now, um, moving on to the physical side of things and level of integration, as we discussed um, with Jan's presentation just before. So we try to work with our partners to co-create or to um, really embed into uh, parking solutions that they may deploy for clean cities and for better first and last mile connectivity. What we call a kind of offer for um, kind of parking um, to PT partners include data sharing. So based on our mobility data, we can really inform public transport operators about the optimal location for additional mobility hubs. Or as was highlighted in the previous presentation, we can also share data to really understand the impact of usage in the various parking hubs that we've set um, with the public transport operator. In terms of the parking stations itself, um, we always collaborate with PT um, partners to install those parking hubs to make sure that we embed efficiently. Um, and, you know, we've tried different pilots with various types of parking um, options. It can be kind of lined or signed parkings, or it can also be uh, rugged solutions. Another initiative that we uh, implement is bonus parking. So what does this mean is that we essentially in our app set up incentivized parking zones next to uh, public transport hubs, transit hubs, and we offer riders free credits when they end their rides close to the public transport station. So that's really a tool for us to incentivize um, riders to end their rides in um, those transport stations and to, of course, connect better with uh, public transportation. And finally, um, the last um, aspect of our parking hubs approach is vehicle rebalancing. We continuously ensure the availability of our vehicles at those parking hubs for a reliable first and last mile user experience. And, and one of the parking research that we ran, I believe, in, in Hamburg, um, we got a very interesting data point that um, from our users, where 58% of the surveyed users um, indicated that micromobility parking hubs at train station could lead them to use public transports more often. Now, um, still on the physical um, side of things, something very important that we set um, with our public transport partners are kind of co-launch, um, like joint marketing activities. Um, we believe that this is very important to seamlessly integrate multimodality into existing um, urban transport networks and to really showcase to the users that we have integrated mobility offers in cities. Um, so what we do is we launch kind of co-branding um, activities. We offer the opportunity to co-brand our vehicles to create this uniform mobility offering in the city. We've done that in various cities and markets uh, where we operate, um, for example, um, in France. We also launch uh, marketing campaigns, both on digital and print media, to once again raise awareness of the benefits of combined usage of micromobility and public transportation, and to ensure uptake from our users. We've also hosted a, a number of events and notably safety events um, to make sure that we're able to educate our users and non-users on this a safe use of micromobility. And combined with public transport. And this is an event, for example, that we've held um, in France. And finally, uh, for my last um, slide, I will talk about the social tool, um, kind of integration layer. And I believe there's been a, a presentation earlier today from um, Hamburg Harban on a partnership that uh, we've worked on together. So what we try to do um, is to better connect cities' outskirts through our mobility offering. And how we do that is by expanding our business area to outer districts and by encouraging users um, to actually use our services in those connected, um, well, in those, sorry, cities' outskirts. We've done that again by setting up physical bonus parking zones near public transport stations to make sure that we can serve as first and last mile mobility hubs for commuters. Um, we have also worked with our partners on deploying mobility hubs that can assure availability and proper parking of e-scooters in those selected areas. The benefits that we've assessed um, from such pilots that we've run in two, um, two markets 
are the increased accessibility of public transport services in outskirts, maybe in areas that are not always easy to reach um, through public transport only. Um, providing kind of climate neutral mobility as shuttles, efficient convenience shuttles to public transport. Um, we provide, of course, increased multimodal travel. So, you know, integrating bus or the train plus micro mobility. And of course, that overall improves uh, the connectivity to city centres. So, as I said, we launched um, two successful pilots in Austria and in Germany. And some of the survey results um, that we got from the Hamburg project were very interesting. Um, again, based on user surveys, um, we observed that 50% of the respondents indicated that they would use they use micro mobility to commute to work or to school. So really adding yet another mobility offer that um, citizens can use on a daily basis for their daily activities and tasks. 44% of the respondents um, said they combine micro mobility and public transport in their trip in their trips on a weekly to monthly basis, which again shows great potential for improved connectivity. And finally, 25% um, indicated that they use multimodal offers on a daily to weekly basis. So I'll stop here and just conclude um, by saying that I hope this presentation provides a bit more background on, as I said, what we think is a more holistic approach to integrating with public transports. We don't believe that, um, you know, integrating digitally only in apps um, is what makes for successful pilots with public transport operators. And we're really keen to investigate how we can, you know, deepen our pilots, our experience in every single layer of social, commercial, digital and physical to make sure that we can really, um, well, get the benefits of um, combined mobility in urban cities. All right, thank you so much, much appreciated. And uh, let's jump right into the discussion. Feel also free to um, uh, ask some of the questions from, from the previous speakers. We, we now have the opportunity to bring it all together. So uh, feel free to raise your hand and ask any direct questions. Uh, there are three questions in the chat, including one from me. Well, then, then, then you got the first ticket and uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll go. I didn't want because Mariette and Lorena came before. So. Okay, then Mariette, uh, you go ahead. I was wondering, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, it's interesting to hear. I know that you're also um, in, available in a few cities in the Netherlands, and especially in Utrecht, um, where you offer this kind of uh, service together as well. Um, have you also or, an, already um, used the TOMP API in the Netherlands? integrated the top API and have or and have you um, done a, are you integrated to the mass one of the mass pilots in the Netherlands? Sure, thank you very much, um, Mariette, for the questions. So yes, we are indeed a working group member of the Tomp API initiative. We our team has just finalized the integration of the standard, which will be rolled out pretty soon. So we're very excited about that. Um, we're for sure looking into mass opportunities in um, the Netherlands, which are led directly by our local team on the ground. If I'm not mistaken, one of the integrations is Gaia, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So yes, this is a project that's ongoing and our local both product and market team are in the process of integrating um, through Tom. So we're very eager to, well, get started and get some results. Great, thank you. Good, Lorena. Thank you, thanks Pauline. It's always nice to keep up with the developments in tier. I was wondering, you mentioned there are two types of digital integration, and I was wondering uh, what might be the bar barriers that the mass providers would uh, come across that they don't go into the full integration, which also allows payment. 
Sure. Thank you very much, Lorena. Um, I would say the main barrier that they may face is really on the technical side of things. Um, integrating this kind of deeper integration takes a lot of resources, of technical capacity and kind of data sharing API developments, really. You also need to build kind of partnerships with partners to process the payment options, for example, um, in the application. So essentially, it is indeed kind of easier for certain partners that do not necessarily need or have the capacity to integrate fully to go through what we call this deep link integration, which links back to our app. But as I said, it does take a lot more capacity to go for the deep integrations. Nevertheless, we have very much seen that the benefits that we generate from such deep integrations are indeed um, a lot more fruitful. Um, the ridership is much higher. The consumer experience is much higher. This is how we can set up uh, joint ticketing offers. So it's really a balance that partners needs to um, need to find. And I'm hoping in the future that, um, you know, both on the operator side on um, mobility service provider, mass and public transport, we'll have more capacity to launch deeper integrations. Great, thanks, Pedro. Now it's, now, now it's your turn. Thank you, Oliver. Pauline, thank you very much for your uh, inspiring presentation, uh, I have to say. Uh, my question is mostly operational. So you, 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 uh, during your presentation, you, you mentioned uh, the vehicle av availability in hubs. You have having to manage that availability. And, and as far as I know, usually it, it involves moving these scooters or other equipments from one point to other. And I've seen in, in several cities that this is made through vans or with staff having to do this all day. And I, I used to live in Lisbon, so usually that's what would happen. So on top of the hills, people started their trips and usually ended downtown next to the public transport interfaces. And then someone needs, needs to bring the, the, the e-scooters back on top of the hills. Does this happen with you also? And does it result in, in additional costs that uh, might not be... Uh, or that might hinder the development of these types of solutions in the integrated hubs? Sure. Thank you very much, Pedro. I think two main points um, to your question. The first one, really, how do we manage availability in those hubs? There are really two ways we do that. The first one that you just mentioned is rebalancing through essentially operations teams, right? We call them rangers and they are um, tier employees that um, go around the city uh, at various times in day based on agreements with the, the city and the local officials um, to make sure that the, the, the our vehicles are correctly positioned, they're parked properly, and also to ensure availability in the parking hubs. The second um, kind of, how to say, more natural rebalancing that we are testing is through user incentiv incentivization, as I said. So setting bonus parkings to pick up a scooter or to park a scooter is something that allows you know, us to essentially use our users for natural rebalancing. And this is the very reason why we've set those bonus parking in the mobility hubs that we set up with public transport operators to make sure that users actually are encouraged to park there. So that's really on how we ensure the availability more on the ops side of things. So essentially, um, as I said, yes, we do have teams um, going around to uh, make sure the fleet is evenly uh, balanced in a territory, in a city territory. Nevertheless, so first of all, we are rolling out um, quite an extensive fleet of e-vans, e-cargo bikes um, to actually do this rebalancing. And secondly, we have, well, very much lowered the carbon footprint of that operation by shifting to swappable batteries, meaning that we do not need to actually carry the scooter anymore, but just the battery. And something else that we have deployed as TIM and that we're starting to rule out in different markets is what we call our charging power boxes. What that is, is a network of little yeah, chargers that can fit four to eight batteries that we place in shops and we incentivize users to go and replace depleted batteries against charged ones themselves in shops. That increased footfall in shops that allows us to get Again, you know, more natural rebalancing and ensuring that our um, scooters are consistently charged on the ground. And that, again, has reduced the environmental footprint of our operations quite substantially. So these are the different methods that we are implementing and also exploring um, to ensure availability. Does that answer your question? Great. Perfectly. Thank you. 
Great, thanks. Uh, Sam. I can also ask the question for you, but you feel free to jump in, Sam. Nope, then, then all right. So uh, Sam's question is on, so when you provided uh, shared e-scooters to help connect the public transport in the outskirts, was the operational area just a, a small area around the station or how well did that connect to the rest of the city's operational zone? Sure, thank you. Um, so I do not have all the details to respond to that question since I wasn't the lead on the project, but essentially the area was very much defined by um, Hamburg Hochbahn and the city. So I believe that there were five key areas that were selected around public transport station in the city's outskirts. Nevertheless, they were still allowing to connect those areas together, right? Um, so this is really for the Hamburg project. Um, and then, you know, it really depends. Essentially, we, of course, um, always suggest uh, various ways of doing these kind of pilots, but we're also going to make sure that the city's needs and requirements um, are met. If we look at the example of the Hamburg project, it was an EU funded um, opportunity. So, you know, the goals and the objectives um, that were set for the pilot were quite um, detailed. And we, of course, uh, wanted to make sure that we're able to, to address those. I suppose, Dominique, you can feel also free to uh, uh, complete if there's anything else. Cool. All right. Great. Um, then um, I think if we don't have any further questions, we can uh, even wrap up a little early, which is great. Um, so as we said, um, uh, recordings will be made available. Uh, Claudia, when do you think you'd we ha have them ready to share and then we can put Next them on our week. website and yeah. Sure. Next week they'll be receiving all the recordings, all the presentations and uh, follow up on site, maybe a little evaluation survey as well, just so we know what we can do better and what we did well. Perfect, then thank you a lot for uh, organizing this, uh, for joining us in this uh, very interesting and lively discussion. And thanks to all the speakers for sharing uh, the many insights. Have a wonderful day and uh, hopefully uh, soon a uh, relaxing weekend. See you soon. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, bye-bye.